Let's do it. First Samuel chapter 22. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Then David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. So he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Now the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in that stronghold, depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth, of course, which is in the land of Judah. When Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered, now Saul was staying in Gibeah under a tamarisk tree in Ramah with a spear in his hand and all of his servants standing about him. Then Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? All of you have conspired against me. There is no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there is not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me. To lie in wait as it is this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who was set over from the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob, to Amalek, the son of Ahitab. And he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. So the king sent to call Amalek, the priest, the son of Ahitab. And all his father's house, the priests who were in Nob, and they all came to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, son of Ahitab. He answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it is this day? So Amalek answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David? Who is the king's son-in-law who goes at your bidding and is honorable in your house? Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Far be it from me. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to any in the house of my father, for your servant knew nothing of all of this, little or much. And the king said, You shall surely die, Amalek. You and all your father's house. Then the king said to the guards who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled, but they did not tell it to me. But the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priest of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, You turn and kill the priest. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck the priest, and killed on that day 85 men who wore a linen ephod. Priest. Also Nob, the city of priests, he struck with the edge of the sword both men and women, children, nursing infants, oxen, donkeys, sheep with the edge of the sword. Now one of the sons of Amalek, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, especially, or excuse me rather, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the Lord's priest. So David said to Abiathar, I knew that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not fear. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. But with me you shall be safe. David's on the run. From Gibeah to Nob, which of course is the city of priests where he received bread and a sword from Amalek. 
And then, of course, from Nob to Gath, which was the hometown of Goliath, a Philistine city, enemy territory. You remember, it was there that David began acting like a madman, and God miraculously delivered him from that foolishness. And then from Gath, he escaped here in chapter 22 to the cave of Adullam. You know, it's interesting that David is the man after God's own heart. He is the anointed one of God, the the chosen one to sit on the throne of Israel. But look at him. Now, the circumstances of his life doesn't look to be very, very promising. Is this what it looks like to belong to God? Is this what it looks like to do his will? Is it to suffer? To be the target of malicious and murderous hatred? To live without worldly comfort or security? And perhaps these are your own thoughts tonight. As you, along with me and many others, navigate the difficult circumstances of life, we see our hurts, our challenges, and we ask ourselves, is this what it looks like to follow Jesus? Suffering, loneliness, persecution, pain, a a nomad in this world? I, I, I don't think this will encourage you, but I think it needs to be said that it is a false and heretical theology that suggests belonging to God will free your life from suffering and adversity. For yes, even we who follow God as David is doing is going to experience loneliness and suffering and persecution. We are going to feel like fugitives, nomads in this world. Chapter 22 reminds us that the anointed one of God is in a lonely place. And I want us to just look at this together, and the best way that I know how to do it is just to give you three or four headers over each section of the verses in the chapter, and the first header is this, the caves of suffering, the caves of suffering. Verse 1 says that David escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now, he escaped to the cave of Adullam because God delivered him to this place. But it doesn't sound like it would be such a comforting place of deliverance, does it? I mean, if God is going to deliver me, why don't he deliver me to the king's palace? Why does he deliver me to the throne in which he promised me? But to get him out of Gad, he delivers David to the cave of Adullam, a dark, isolated, dirty cave, a cave of suffering. But church, sometimes in life, God has to bring us to this very cave. He has to bring us to this place. Because dark caves of suffering are where we learn some of God's greatest lessons for us. David had to learn some lessons, and I wrote down two implicit lessons here. One, he learned that God was his refuge in suffering. He learned that God was his refuge in suffering. Now, it was in Gath that David renewed his trust in God. And I don't have time to go back and rehearse all of chapter 21, but we were reminded as we went through chapter 21 that both Psalm 56 and Psalm 34 was written by David while he was under this intense situation in Gath. And we learned that it was in Gath through those Psalms that David repented of his fear. He repented of his scheming and trying to figure out how to get away from Saul. And he paused again and he said, Lord, I'm I'm sorry for trying to do this myself. I'm going to trust you. And that is the reason why God got him out of that madman experience in Gath and delivered him to this cave. But now here in the cave of Adullam, David learned that God and God alone would be his place of refuge. That God and God alone would be his place of safety. Now, now it's interesting to me that, that Adullam 
actually means refuge. The word itself. And so no doubt here, David is safe in this cave. But it wasn't this cave that David was to trust for his safety. It wasn't a doolum that he needed to find refuge in. It was God in whom he needed to find refuge. Of course, we have insight into this lesson learned by David as we uh, discover two more psalms that were written while he was in the cave of Adullam. Psalm 57 is one of those psalms, and Psalm 142 is also another psalm in which David penned while he's sitting in this dark, dirty, lonely cave learning to find refuge in God. And he did learn that lesson. Hold your place there in 1 Samuel 22 and skip over, if you would, to Psalm 57. Psalm 57, let's look at a couple of these verses. He's writing this while sitting in the cave of Adullam. Psalm 57, verse 1, he says, Be be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge. That's where God needed to get David. Not to where he saw his hiding place, his cave as his refuge of safety, but but God to be his refuge. Wherever he may be, God is my place of safety. Verse 2, David says, I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. That is, the, the God who fulfills all purposes in my life. He shall sin from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. But be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a bit before me. And in the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. But my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches under the heavens and your truth under the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. That's what God wants to hear from us when we are in the caves of suffering. God, you are my Refuge, you're my safety, and I will praise you as the guardian and protector of my life. He writes another psalm here, again in Psalm 57. Turn over to Psalm 142. I want you to see these. This is what David is learning while he's in the cave. Shorter psalm, let's look at least the first five verses, Psalm 142. Verse 1, I cried out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. In the way in which I walk, they have secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see, there is no one who acknowledges acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. There's that cave of loneliness. And verse 5 says, David, I cried out to you, O Lord, and I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. God had to bring David to a lonely place in a dark, dirty cave for him to acknowledge that no matter what the circumstances of his life would be, there God would always be his place of safety, his place of refuge. He was in the cave of suffering. David found God to be his only refuge, so he he renews his trust in the Lord. He, He began to fully embrace that God would fulfill his purposes for David. And so he's learning some lessons. He learned that God was his refuge in suffering. I wrote down number two here. He learned that he was never truly alone. Now, he said that in Psalm 142, right? I looked on my right hand and my left, and no one was there. I had no safety. Everyone had abandoned me. But go back to 1 Samuel 22, because in verse number 1, it says, after arriving to the cave of Adullam, however long the period of time was, that his brothers 
and his father's house heard it. Heard what? Heard that David was in the cave. Now, if you'll remember a couple of weeks ago in chapter 21, that the question from the chapter was whether or not David was being honest to Amalek about being by himself when he came to see the priest. Remember, Amalek said, what are you doing all by yourself? And he said, well, my, my men are at this and this place. I'm just coming to you privately. And the question was, was, that, was he being totally honest or were there men with him? Now, now verse 1, to me, now to me, you may come to a different conclusion, but to me it seems to set the record straight because David must have truly had a few people, a few people with him for how else would David's family know where he was? Now remember, the times are different. There's no Facebook post that David clicks to mark him safe from King Saul. So somehow, without David leaving the cave, they had to have heard where he was. And so I I think it's, it's very possible that a few, maybe only two or three, we don't know, was with David. But he still felt loneliness. And verse 1 says that his brothers and all of his father's house, look at it again, they went down there to him. They went down to the cave. Now... Of course, David was certainly feeling alone and forsaken in the cave of Adullam. We just read it in Psalm 142. He said, look on my right hand and see, there's there's no one who acknowledges me. No one cares for my soul. And you don't have to turn back there, but when you come to verse 7 of Psalm 142, David changes his tune. He says, but the righteous will surround me, for you, God, have dealt bountifully with me. And as we look in verse 1 and 2, the righteous did surround him. His family comes to him in the cave, and I believe they come to him as a, as, a, as a show of solidarity, support, and encouragement. They went to be with their son, their brother, who was hurting. Not only his family, but look at verse number two. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented, they gathered to him, and David became captain over them, and there were about... 400 men with him, all right? So, so no longer is David alone in the cave. Now it's, a, now it's a crowded cave. And he soon realized that there were others who were suffering just like him. Because these weren't people gathering together with David who had everything going perfectly for them. No, it is specifically said here that this was the the discontented, those who were in debt, those who were in distress. By the way, this is exactly what the prophet Samuel had warned Israel about when they demanded the king that they wanted. All the way back in chapter 8, you have to go back and look at it for yourselves. But in 1 Samuel chapter 18 said, listen, Samuel uh, chapter 8, Samuel said, "You, you need to rethink this. Israel, because the type of king that you're demanding, he's not going to make your life better. He's going to make your life worse. And now we get to chapter 22, and we see that that is exactly what happened. But consider this group for a moment. They're distressed. They're in debt. They're discontented. By all accounts, these are not the people most of the world would want on their team. They were not the cream of the crop. They were nobodies. People who were wounded and hurting and considered losers and failures. Does it remind you of another group of people that we study so closely in the New Testament? Yeah, the the 12 that Jesus called and gathered unto himself. Yeah, that they were considered losers and failures and in debt and distress, wounded and hurting. Yet these are the very people whom God gathered together in that cave to be with David. People who were not perfect, but yet they were willing to suffer with David, God's anointed. And listen to me very carefully this evening. The kind of people that God gathers to carry out his kingdom purposes are broken, weak, and struggling people. And that ought to encourage you tonight. For 1 Corinthians tells us it's not many wise, it's not many mighty, it's not many noble. No, it's broken people, weak people, people whom the world considers as losers and failures, those who are struggling to get by in life. Those are the people God says, I want you on my team. And So he gathers together into his church one body, a group of nobodies, a group of people who are barely hanging on. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel, isn't it? 1 Samuel 22, 2. 
And a true gospel identity is when we gather regularly with these kinds of people in the caves of their suffering to point each other to the refuge that we have in God. Remember, David is a picture of who? He is a picture of Jesus, the perfect anointed one. And so God has gathered these nobodies together unto the anointed one. And the anointed one has become captain over them. And he's going to lead them to fulfill his purposes. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ has done through, through us or for us, with us, through the blood of his cross. He has gathered unto our captain, the anointed Messiah, Jesus Christ. And we are a bunch of nobodies. We are losers and failures in this world. Nobody's writing about us in their papers tomorrow. Nobody's giving us World Series rings next week. We are a bunch of nobodies. Weak, broken, struggling people. But we are exactly the people God wants. That'll encourage you. Because no matter how low you feel on the ladder tonight, you're exactly on the place God wants to use you for his kingdom purposes. So we see the cave of suffering, the cave of suffering. And we need to be reminded that when we are suffering, feeling like we're all alone, there's a whole lot of more people around who are going through the same struggles that we are. You're not alone. Look around you. There's a lot of people distressed, in debt, and discontented. Write down number two, the steps of obedience. The steps of obedience. That brings us to verses three through five. So, so in verse three, David leaves the cave of Adullam to, to go over to Moab. Now, Moab was a neighbor to Israel, but he was also, he was also an enemy of Saul. But I want you to think about this. You're going to have to put on your, your Bible history thinking caps for just a moment, all right? Because David has a purpose in coming here. He says to the king of Moab, please let my father, verse 3, please let my father and mother come here with you. Well, the question is, why would David go outside of Israel's territory to the enemy of Saul to help his parents find safety? Why Moab? Well, does anybody remember, perhaps, in biblical history, why David and Moab would have some significance? Well, David has a family connection to Moab. His great-grandmother, her name, Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess woman. She's from Moab. So in the providence and sovereignty of God, even decades later, God is still showing the fulfillment of everything he does in life. Every step that we take is to bring about his purposes, even when we're not around to see it. You see, the things that God may be doing in your own life may be for your great-grandchildren that you may never even see one day. This is amazing to me. I, I look at this and smile, and I'm just reminded that here we are. We, we've, we've studied Ruth a long, long time ago, and we see that, yes, through Ruth, you, she brings David. And now we're all the way here in 1 Samuel 22, and he happens to go find a place where his parents will be safe from, from Saul and, and harm's way. And where does he go to do it? Well, the place that his great-grandmother's from. Oh, yeah, she happens to be Ruth. It's amazing how God orders our steps, isn't it? How God providentially puts us in places with people to bring about his sovereign purposes. But, but again, what is David doing here? Well, he's taking care of his aging parents. Getting them out of harm's way until he knows definitively what God wants him to do. And by the way, that was the right thing to do. He's honoring God, following God. The law by making sure that his parents were taken care of. Look at it again there in verse 3. Please let my father and mother come here with you till I know. This is good. Think about this. David says, till I know what God is going to do for me. So by that statement, what is David acknowledging? He's acknowledging that he's, that he's waiting. He's waiting on God to tell him what to do next. Which, again, is another evident sign that he is truly trusting the Lord instead of simply scheming his own runaway plan. He wasn't really fully trusting the Lord when he went from Gibeah to Nob and Nob to Gath. But, but now, after being in the cave of suffering, now when God brought him to a place of adversity and loneliness, he, he's learned, well, I'm not, I'm not going to figure this out for myself anymore. I'm just going to do what I know is right to do while I'm waiting for God to tell me where to go. <laughs> And while I'm waiting for God to tell me what to do, it's a great practical application for our lives today. And here's the, here's the application. Church, do what you know is right to do while you wait for God. Some of you are waiting on God 
for some things in your life, him to tell you which direction to go, where he wants you to be, what he wants you to accomplish, what he wants you to do. What do I do while I'm waiting? Nobody likes to wait. I remember preaching in the life of Joseph on the first sermon series I did back in 2008 when we came here. We called it the waiting rooms of life. Nobody likes a waiting room. Sitting around, you read the same magazine over and over and over again. You checked in 45 minutes ago. When are they going to call my name? You go up there. Hey, oh, I'm sorry, sir. We forgot to write you down. Are you here now? Yeah, I'm here now. I've been here for 45 minutes. When is it going to be my turn? We'll take your number here. We'll call your number when it's your turn. You look up, you're 60 numbers away. We don't like to wait. But let me tell you, God doesn't work on the same schedule that we do. And a lot of times in the Christian life, we are waiting, waiting, waiting. And that's when we get ourselves in trouble. We don't do smart things when we're waiting on God. But now David's learned that lesson the hard way. He's going to do what he knows is right to do until God tells him the next step that he wants him to take. And in David's case, he knew the right thing to do was to take care of his family. So he goes to Moab, asks permission of the king, can my parents hide out here until God tells me what he wants me to do? And when God told him what to do, he continued to obey. Look at it there in verse number five. Now the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold. This was a place David must have been waiting. Depart, go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Herath. Now going back to the land of Judah was not a place of safety, by the way. This is back into Saul's domain. Sometimes God asks us to go places where it's not safe, where it's not convenient, where we're going to have to take risk. He might be asking you to step out on faith and put yourself in a position where you don't have it all figured out. But David has now learned to trust and obey the plans and purposes of God, no matter where those plans take him. In this case, it's back in Saul's domain, yet he's being obedient. He's being obedient. Listen to me, church. You are never more safe in your life than when you're taking steps of obedience. Steps of obedience. Do what you know is right to do while you wait on God. All right, write down this third thing because i got to move quickly. The evil of God's enemy. The evil of God's enemy. So we see the cave of suffering. The cave of suffering. Every time I say that, my mind goes, the cave of wonders. No, it's not the, the cave of wonders. It's the cave of suffering, all right? The cave of suffering, steps of obedience. And now all of a sudden we get a look at what Saul's doing. Look at verse 6. We're not going to read all the verses, but let me just tell you what's going on here. Of course, by the looks of things, Saul seems to be in control with the upper hand. We find him sitting. He's, he's resting in place out in the open with a group of his men surrounding him just just waiting for him to tell them what, what he wants them to do. But Saul is a very paranoid king. And when it comes to David, we've also learned that Saul is a very insecure man. So while it looks like he has the upper hand, you know, sitting under this tree wide open, and you could, you look, you, you could do a whole sermon on contrasting David with Saul in 1 Samuel 22. David's hiding out in the cave, Saul's hanging out in the open. David's lonely with the 400 men, uh, Saul has uh, thousands of men ready at his disposal. It, it's a great contrast back and forth. David has found security and refuge in God, Saul is paranoid and freaking out. Now look at what he says to his men in verse 7, that is Saul. He says, to those servants who stood about him, here now you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? All of you have conspired against me, and there is no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse, and there is not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie and wait as it is this day. Again, we, we look at this contrast because David's sitting in a cave writing psalms. Saul sitting out in the open propagating conspiracy theories. There's no evidence that his men were turning against him. No evidence whatsoever. It's what he says here. Why are you all conspiring against me? There's no evidence for that. And it's not true that David is stirring up war with Saul at the prompting of his son Jonathan. That's not true either. In fact, it's the other way around. It's Saul who's initiated all of this. 
But that's what happens when our eyes are not on the truth. This is what happens, church, when your eyes and my eyes are not focused on God. We believe and propagate conspiracy theories about ourselves and about others that are simply not true. And so here he is. He's chewing them out for something that is not factual. And nobody's saying anything. But all of a sudden, when we come to verse number 9... The villain of chapter 21 makes another appearance. Doeg. Doeg. What a name. Verse 9, then answered Doeg, the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul, said, Now, now, king, I want you to know, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob to Amalek, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of the Goliath, the Philistine. Now let me just tell you, here again, Doeg is learning from Saul because he's not telling the story the right way. It was true that he saw David. It was true that he was with Amalek. But he leaves out the part that Ahimelech knew nothing about the tension between Saul and David. He makes it sound like in verses 9 and 10 that Ahimelech was in on the whole deal. I don't have time to take you there tonight, but write down Psalm 52. Psalm 52 is another psalm that David wrote during this whole episode. And you know who he wrote about? Doeg. He writes an entire psalm about Doeg and his deception and his dishonesty and his lies and his manipulation. It's a reminder that lying and deception may get you to the top, as in the case of Doeg with Saul, but it will never bring you honor from God. Doeg is not telling the whole truth. He's putting Amalek, Ahimelech, excuse me, and David in this difficult position because he's not being honest. But regardless, Saul sins for Ahimelech and the priest of Nob in verse number 11. He says to them, why did you do this to David? Why? Look at verse 11. So the king sent to call Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all of his father's house, the priests who were in Nob. And they all came to the king. And Saul said, here now, son of Ahitub. This is how disrespectful Saul got. He won't even call people by their first names. You notice that? You son of Ahitub. He never calls David David. He always calls him the son of Jesse. Disrespectful. He doesn't care for people. Of course, Ahimelech is respectful. He answers back, here I am, my Lord. Saul said to him, verse 13, why have you conspired against me? You and the son of Jesse, and that you were giving him bread and a sword of inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Of course, of course, Ahimelech says, why would I inquire of the Lord that David rose up against you when David is the most faithful servant that you have? Again, Ahimelech is reiterating that he knew nothing about this matter between he and David, but that would not stop Saul from acting out in unimaginable violence. Because even though Amalek was proving and showing his innocence in the whole matter, look at what the king said in verse 16. The king looked at him and said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Of course, the king turns to his servants and says, Kill him and the priest of the Lord. And what do we read in verse 17? The priest wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. They knew better than to participate in such foolishness to kill the Lord's priest. So so when his servants wouldn't do it, what does Saul do? Well, here comes Doeg again. He turns to Doeg. Look at verse 18. And the king said to Doeg, you turn and kill the priest. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck the priest. He killed on that day 85 men who wore linen followed, 85 priests of the Lord. Also, he went to Nob. We don't know if Saul wanted him to do this or whether he was just in a killing spree. But he goes down to Nob, the city of the priests, and he struck with the edge of the thorn. Men, women, children, nursing infants, oxen, donkey, sheep with the edge of the thorn. He, he wipes out everybody. I, I read this church, and I, I can't help but think that Saul is the New Testament definition of Antichrist. David is the representation of the anointed one. And Saul is anti the anointed one. 
He's become like Pharaoh in Egypt during the days of Moses. He's become like Herod in Bethlehem when killing all the infants at Jesus' birth. Saul has become evil, a wicked enemy of God. David is God's anointed, but Saul is the anti-anointed. He is the man who will always be known, church. He will always be known for standing against, in brutal tyranny, the anointed one of God. What a horrific scene. And what a contrast between God's chosen and who the people wanted. All right, let me give you one more header and we'll wrap this up. The presence of God's anointed. That brings us to verse 20 through 23. So verse 20 tells us that one of the sons of Ahimelech escaped Saul and Doeg's slaughter. His name is Abiathar. He escapes and he comes to David. Now, notice David's re. Reply here. He takes, he takes responsibility for what happened with Doeg and all the priests being slaughtered. And when I say he takes responsibility for what happened, what I mean is in the sense that he should have dealt with Doeg. David is thinking, I, I saw him. I knew he was there. When I saw him, I, I should have dealt with him, but I didn't. And if I could go back and do it over again, I would have provided more information to a Ahimelech that wouldn't have got him into this difficult position. We don't know if it would have really saved his life or not, but David is at least taking responsibility that when he was not trusting the Lord, taking refuge in God, he also brought a lot of other people in harm's way. Look, look at what he says there in verse 22. So David said to Abiathar, I knew that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. So he's taking responsibility. He's already repented of this. We learned of that through the Psalms when he was in Gath. And of course he acknowledges the error here. And God has forgiven him, by the way. God has restored David for his lack of trust. For remember, it was in the cave of his suffering that David learned these valuable lessons that will change his life forever. But that's not the only thing he takes responsibility for. We look at verse 23, and he takes responsibility for Abathar. Verse 23, he says to the priest, stay with me, do not fear. Again, this is a change in David's approach, isn't it? Because when he first ran from Gibeah to Nob, it was about surviving alone. But now he has learned something very important. He has learned, church, that there is safety as God's anointed. Perhaps he didn't realize before when he's run away and hiding in the way that he was doing that, that, I, that I'm God's anointed. And God has promised that, that his, his anointed, he's going to fulfill this purpose in my life. He wasn't thinking that. But now, after going through the cave of suffering... He's learned some lessons, and one of those lessons is that there is always safety when you are the anointed of God. Now, that doesn't take away the fact that people will still be out to get him and anyone who's associated with him. Because look at what he says in verse 23 after he tells Abiathar to stay with him. He says, stay with me, do not fear, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. This is the nature of Israel right now under Saul's tyranny. David is the anointed one of God, and Saul is out to get anyone who is with David. So David says, Abiathar, stay with me, because the one who seeks my life is also seeking to destroy your life. But, look at the rest of the verse 23, but, David says, with me you shall be safe. Remember who it is who's saying this. The anointed one. The chosen one of God. The true king of Israel is saying, stay with me. Don't fear. They're going to try to destroy you because they're trying to do, destroy me. But Abiathar, with me, with me, you are safe. Now the question is, how in the world can he say this? 
because he has finally learned that as God's anointed, nothing will be able to ever stop God's purposes for him. That has gospel implications, doesn't it? Because he who seeks to destroy him, Jesus, seeks also to destroy you, his followers. Jesus said in John 15, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So tune out any teaching, any theology, any book that says when you follow God, uh, no more suffering, no more heartache, no more adversity, no more persecution, no friend. Jesus said, who in the world are you to think? that you can escape this kind of suffering and persecution if I couldn't even escape it. They who seek to destroy me seek also to destroy you. And that is the world we live in as followers of Christ. The world is not friendly to believers. They're not rolling out the red carpet to make your life comfortable and peaceful. No, they despise you. Why? Because they despise Jesus. And they will do everything in their power to destroy the church because they want to do everything in their power to destroy the gospel of Jesus. It's the same principle. The anointed one, David, anybody who's associated with the anointed one is on the line. And anybody who's associated with Jesus will live their lives on the line. On the line. Because his adversary is our adversary. That's why Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. You have an adversary. Oh, by the way, same adversary that's Jesus' adversary. The devil, he's as a roaring lion. He's walking about seeking whom he may devour, whom he may to destroy. Listen, those who seek to destroy Jesus will seek to destroy us. I wrote down this final statement. In the presence of God's anointed, Jesus Christ, you will be safe. It is true that they who seek to destroy him will seek to to destroy you. But, but as it was with Abiathar, those who are in the presence of Christ anointed, the anointed of God, Jesus Christ, will be safe. Psalm 91 9. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. That's a hard one to understand, isn't it? What do you mean? Does that mean if I make God my refuge, if I find safety in Christ, that no evil's going to touch me, no plague, no pandemic, no sickness is going to come upon me? Understand. It doesn't mean that neither suffering nor persecution will ever touch you. It means that in Christ, it can never destroy your soul. That in Christ, it can never separate you from him. Paul said it like this in Romans chapter 8. Not even death, nor life, nor principalities, nor angels, none of these things will ever be able to separate you from the love of God. Why? No matter what the enemy tries to do to you, if you are in Christ, if you are in the presence of God's anointed, you are safe. You are safe. Are you safe tonight? Well, the answer to that question is, are you in Christ? Are you with God's anointed? Because if you are with God's anointed by putting your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, who is the anointed of God, then no matter what does befall you, you are safe. We've mentioned all of these in the sermon. Let me give them to you in conclusion. They're there in your notes. What are the practical conclusion? Well, let's just... Remind ourselves and pray. Dark caves of suffering are where we learn some of God's greatest lessons for us. Number two, the kind of people that God gathers to carry out his kingdom purposes are broken, weak, and struggling people. Number three, do what you know is right to do while you wait for God. Number four, lying and deception may get you to the top, but it will never bring you honor from God. Number five, he who seeks to destroy him, Jesus, seeks also to destroy you, his followers. And lastly, in the presence of God's anointed, Jesus Christ, you will be safe. Thank the Lord. You see, you and I are not David. 
Jesus is our David. He's our Messiah, the anointed one of God. May we run to him for safety. Let's stand together for prayer.